church. So good to see you all. Why don't you stand to your feet? Who's come ready to praise and worship? Come on, let's make a decision this morning from the outset that we're gonna worship God, regardless of how we're feeling today. Come on, we haven't come to a concert, but we've come to church to lift up Jesus. So if you're joining us online, why don't you stand to your feet as well? Come on, let's worship Him this morning.
um, we're just going to prepare ourselves to give our offering. Um, the offering won't be taken up right now, um, but it will be taken up at the end of the service. But if you need a debit card slip to designate your giving this morning, you can just pop your hand in the air and one of our amazing hosts will bring that to you. I love my paper Bible, but it's a little tricky to hold sometimes. I just wanted to read a quote to you that I read this week from Steve McCracken. He said, we will undervalue our preparation for eternity if we place too much value on our temporary needs. In John 17, Jesus said, for you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And you know, as I give, every time I give, I just try to set my mind on eternal things. I try to set my mind on the kingdom of God and, and remember that um, that as I give, it's we're giving into something eternal. We're giving into something that matters. We're giving into something where we hope to see the fruit. I love seeing fruit. I love seeing the fruit of my labor and the fruit of my giving. But even if I don't, I know that I'm sowing seeds into God's kingdom to expand His house, to expand the people within it, to grow the people within it, and to essentially make His name known um, out of these four walls and into the community and surround. So I hope today as you give that you could just be encouraged to continue to lift your eyes onto eternal things, continue to lift your eyes onto the kingdom of God and know that we're giving into something that will make an eternal difference. I just have a couple of announcements to share with you as well. Um, we've got prayer week coming up from March the 22nd to the 26th. We're going to have prayer meetings at our Swan campus and at our Malaga um, campus on Monday and Wednesday morning at 6.30 a.m., which I think mornings are better than nights because I'm so tired at night time. So I hope to see you as we come together and pray first thing in the morning. Um, that's just such a powerful way to start the day, but it's so powerful to come together and declare the things of God together. You know, sometimes when we want to see a difference made, there's a cost to us. There's a cost. And I think a couple of early mornings is worth the cost to see a difference in our church and in our local community. Can you believe it is almost Easter? I can't believe it. I bought Easter eggs, then I may have eaten them this week. So I know no one else here would ever do that to their kids. Um, obviously, that's just my confession today, but I will replenish and make sure that there are enough for Easter Sunday. But, you know, I'm so excited to come together with church family on Good Friday. That's the Friday we're joining our Malaga and Swan campus here together at 10 a.m. And we're going to remember who Jesus is and what He did for us. And it's so incredibly powerful. Um, and then we'll come together again on Sunday and just celebrate the life we have in Christ. Are you excited to do that? It's an incredibly special um, time for us as Christians. So I really hope that that weekend will be a priority for you and your family to come and worship and celebrate who God is together. And on Easter Sunday, we also have our baptisms. And that is such an amazing, encouraging, uplifting morning that, you know, I once missed one because we were away and it was just so tough not being with church family when new Christians and new believers were making a declaration um, of faith with all of us here as a church family. So if you're here and you haven't been baptised, can you please come and see myself or see one of our leadership team after the service? And we would love to help you understand more about what, what baptism is and why we get baptised. Um, we'd love to have that conversation with you. So um, please come and see me after the service if that's you. We're going to come together around communion now. So I'm just going to hand over to my better half, Carl, and he's going to lead us around that. You're definitely the better half. Um, hey, good morning, church. We're going to have communion. And um, you may have grabbed something on the way through from the host. But if you haven't, uh, please pop up your hand if, if you want to um, get some communion and, and join us this morning. And someone can bring me one too that would be awesome thanks guys oh, thanks hey with easter coming up and with um with what we've been sort of talking about in connect groups and in the vision of the church it's very timely that we talk about and reflect on jesus's death and his sacrifice and um, I just want to touch on Passover and how it links in with communion.
communion, which we take today, and how it links in with connecting into the vine. So um, this morning, I'm just going to read from Exodus 12, a very brief verse here, um, some context, just paraphrasing the, the Israelites have been, um, Moses has been back and forth with um, Pharaoh and the Israelites are trying to get out of slavery in Egypt. And, um, and this is, there's been many opportunities for Pharaoh uh, to, to let the Israelites go. But um, finally, we, we see Passover and we see how God protects the Israelites. And this verse, verse 5, um, talks about what the sacrifice needs to look like for the protection of the firstborn of the Israelites. The animal you choose must be a year old male without defect and you must uh, you must take them from a sheep or the goats and then later we see in Luke in the last supper as Jesus is talking about um, he's prophesying his sacrifice that's going to cover the sins of the world in the last supper he's, uh, in, in verse um, 7 in chapter 22 then came the day of unleavened bread on which Passover lamb had been sacrificed. And Jesus said, uh, sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare it? Uh, <laughs> where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, Where's the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. And they left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. And when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And he begins to prophesy about it. For I tell you, I will not eat again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks for it and said, Take this and divide it amongst you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, he gave thanks and broke it. He gave it to them saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant of my blood, which is poured out for you. And he goes on to talk about his betrayal. And in Connect, we've been talking, and, and in the vision of the church, we've been talking about discipleship and about connecting in with the vine. And Jesus is the true vine. And his one commandment after he's talking to his disciples about connecting and staying in the vine is to love and that they will have fruit if they're connected into the vine if we we've got an opportunity right now to stay connected into the vine you might be feeling this morning i'm not connected into the vine i'm not connected into jesus and his purposes and what he's got for my life right now and my encouragement to you is to just take this time and reflect jesus what is it that that looks like what does my being connected into the vine look like this morning how do I draw closer to you and how do I connect into your vine how do I bear fruit and what does that fruit look like and God we just this morning God we just pray that you would speak to us God your Holy Spirit would reveal and unpack those scriptures for us what is this communion that we share together what is this encouragement that you have for us, God, this morning? Church, just as we take a moment, we take this cracker in remembrance of Jesus Christ, who died for us, his body, the lamb, his blood was spilled out for us, for our protection to take our sin is an atonement for our sin. So of every head bowed, God, I just pray that 
you would show us the cost of what you have done. God, I pray that that would, would re- it would resonate with our spirits this morning. Thank you, Lord. And in the same way, we take this juice representative of the blood of the Lamb poured out. God, will the reality of your blood and your sacrifice be shown to us? Not that this is we, we partake is, is real blood, God, but that this is a, a moment we take and we, we reflect upon your sacrifice. Where you poured out everything for us, that there was no greater love than that of you laying down your life for us. Thank you, Jesus. church we're going to continue to worship and kids if you want to head out to dbk now's the opportunity thanks steve i'll just invite you right now to stand to your feet as we continue to worship god together this morning
every breath is my offering, my heart cries, and these lungs sing over you.
mountain and in the valley, he's still good. Come on, he's our treasure. He's our reward. Come on, don't let your feelings dictate to you in this moment. Come on, lift up your praise. Lift up your faith in this place. Come on, let's declare this out. I'm dancing on. Oh, I'm dancing on in the rising sun to a hopeful future. To come, come on, declare it. And when seasons change, which they do, no, I won't give up on you, Lord, because you never failed me. Come on, and no, not one. No, I'm dancing on to the rising sun, to a hopeful future in you, for the dreams to come. Sweet. 
just focus our minds on Christ right now. If your thoughts have been darting back and forth, that's okay, that's normal, that's human, but let's just focus our um, minds on Christ. Let's contemplate His beauty. Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and last, beginning and end. Through Him, all things exist and find their being. He is the rock of Israel, the bright morning star. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. When the man came to him and Jesus said, what do you want? He said, I want to see. Jesus made him see. He holds all authority in heaven and on earth. All glory and power is due to His name. He's far above. He holds all majesty. The train of His robe fills the temple with glory. His glory shall spread across the earth as the waters cover the seas. Jesus, You are great. Right now, I just confess You as Lord once again. Father, I just pray that you would give us the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to take up our cross again today and follow Jesus. And Lord, nowhere more is that signified when Jesus said these words. Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from my lips, but not my will, but yours be done. And I pray that same prayer today, not my will, but your will be done. And I thank you for the grace of Jesus that lets me walk according to the Spirit. May we all be filled with the Spirit again today. Lord, our heart is to glorify You. I pray this week, as we're about to focus on the Word of God, that it would stir us and shape us to be filled with the Holy Spirit this week as we go out into our homes, the way that we treat our spouse and our children, the way that we behave at work, our secret life, that nobody sees except the Lord. I pray that all that we would do would be according to the glory of God. In Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may take your seats, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Clyde. Great. Thank you, team. Hey, why don't we just thank the worship team? Man, they get up early. They come to practices using their gift. And I just want to say thank you, team. It's, we don't take that for granted. We get to sleep in a little bit, and they are here early to, to worship the Lord and to serve us. So we're thankful for that. And, and I just do want to encourage anybody, if you have any musical gifts, God's given you those gifts like He gave the Levites in the Old Testament to worship and serve Him in His house. And can I encourage you, if you've got those type of gifts, please join the team. We absolutely need volunteers all the time because um, obviously our team loves serving God, but you know, you can only be on so much before your physical body gets tired. And so we want to encourage you, let's, um, let's serve one another in that way. So I want to encourage you, you can see Mel, if you want to join the team and you've got any creative ability and technical ability, um, I have none of those things. But I have a great beard. Who likes my beard? I feel like I picked up some Bulls Book Roadkill and stuck it to my face with some super glue. Yeah. White men can't jump. 
or grow beards apparently. So I'll leave it to the professionals. I might shave it off soon. It's getting very itchy. Well, um, it's good to see you all. I have not been here for two weeks and uh, just felt so much love in my heart for this congregation, my family, as we've gathered together here today. And uh, I've been, uh, last two weeks, I firstly went to our Malaga campus and spoke there. And can I just say, Jake and Tegan, who have come from Darwin and campus passes there, they're doing a fantastic job in, in the Malaga campus. We're a one church, two campuses. They're really doing a good job. And so my prayers are with them. I hope you're praying for them. They're starting to build a great team there. They're starting to see new families come into the church. And they've got some great outreach. One of their key outreaches right now is Toddler Jam. They're in the Malaga community. I think they had, I can't remember, someone told me maybe 60 people or something in the building the other day just there for Toddler Jam. And the great thing about that is, is that you've got the witness of Christian people loving Jesus just there with people in our community and saying, you're important, you matter, your children matter, and we want to serve you. And I love that. So um, great job. Tegan's leading that. Uh, maybe she would tell you it's probably not her natural fit. But who knows sometimes that God asks us to do things that we don't feel equipped for. And one of the prime examples of that is Moses saying, you know, God, I can't speak. I'm not a good orator. And and God says, you're going to Egypt, mate. And uh, he uses a man who doesn't have much confidence to do mighty things. That gives me confidence about myself, doesn't it? It's like, hey, I'm not that qualified. I'm not that talented. I'm not that great. But God can use me. Is it, who's thankful for that? Who's thankful for that? That it's actually more about God's grace um, than it is about your personality or, or whatever. So thankful for that. So very, very thankful for them. And then last week I was in Bunbury. And just to give you a little bit of a network update, um, Bunbury, of course, Dale and Steph moved over to Melbourne. So we're currently looking for lead pastors there. And, and uh, I think, that, you know, I'll just leave that in Dale and Karen's hands and the Lord's hands. He's got the right people for that. But I was there last week just to love on the people and, um, and talk about, um, go there on their mission Sunday, talk about mission and vision and, and the Word of God. And it was so great. And I'm so encouraged there. They've got a great eldership team who are just pastorally caring for the people. One of the elders said to me, you know, like for the longest time, I've never seen the church more stable, which is surprising, right? Because you'd think, well, man, do people feel sort of like a bit nervous or unsure because there's not a a specific leader there right now? And Dale and Karen are providing leadership, but they're over in Melbourne. And so it is a little bit different, but they just said people are being loved for, the church is uniting together. They're, They're just seeking the face of God. So I was so encouraged by that. Isn't it good? It's God's church, amen. And God said, I want you to go and make disciples. But he, he said, I'm going to make the church grow. So sometimes we try and make the church grow. And God said, actually, I just want you to make disciples. I'm in charge of growing the church. And so thank God that he doesn't give us tasks that we can't accomplish. Only he can do that. So I'm thankful for that. But yeah, can, can we please be praying for Bunbury? Pray for our church there. Great leaders, great staff, great people. And we want the right leader at the right time. God's good at that, isn't it? Ah, uh, so good. Okay. Hey, um, well, it's good to be here again with all of you today. You know, um, for the last few weeks, um, we have been doing together as a church, um, we've been doing Lent. Who's, uh, who's been um, engaged and involved in the Bible reading Lent plan or new version? I've been loving it. It's been challenging. For those of you who are possibly younger or maybe new to following Christ and not really familiar with what Lent is. You know, probably in evangelical congregations, Pentecostal congregations, um, congregations may be part of denominations that are only, you know, uh, have only been on the scene for the last 100 years. We've got to remember that there's 2,000 years of church history and tradition. So, you know, for us Pentecostals, we're the babies. We just got to remember that. And, um, you know, sometimes there can be some pride around... Um, the charismatic churches and things like that, and uh, that's not right, absolutely not right. Um, but we've got to remember there's a whole, whole range of tradition dating back, and some of it's bad, obviously. We look through church history and say that's not good, but some of it's very good. And, you know, looking back, some of the church orthodoxy and the traditions that the church has carried out for the last, you know, 2,000 years, I think it would do us very well in today's landscape uh, where secularism, secularism is so big and so wide-ranging, for the church to get back to a little bit of orthodoxy and to really focus in on the core of what we believe and actually take some of those old things that the church did and renew them in today and say, hey, actually, these guys knew what they were doing. They weren't just making things up. And Lent is one of those things we actually established formally at one of the councils of Nicaea um, in the 300s. Um, 
AD. And so uh, it's been around for a long time in church history. And it was actually, you could date it back to the Apostolic Fathers where it was being carried out. And it was traditionally that six weeks before the Easter period celebration. It didn't used to be called Easter, of course. We um, changed the name of a pagan festival when um, the church started to go into Europe. Um, But we would celebrate that time where Christ died for us and was risen again. And the church traditionally, six weeks before, would spend that six weeks fasting, doing charity, and doing penance or repentance. And that's what Ash Wednesday is all about for Catholics where um, they would put the ash on their forehead. And it goes back to the Old Testament where people used to repent and they used to do what? They used to cover themselves with sackcloth, which was like itchy cloth. And what? Ashes. And ashes was a symbol of repentance. And so that's what Ash Wednesday is all about. And so really, for a long time in the Christian calendar, Lent has become more about fasting, um, but originally it was far more about penance and repentance. And can I say that in Pentecostal circles, and really for us, repentance, um, the Catholics have something right in that they do repentance, I think, quite well. They have a sacrament based around repentance called confession, and you can go and confess. And I think we've lost the art of that maybe in some of our charismatic, evangelical, Pentecostal type of churches Confession is really powerful. And so today, I want to speak about something that Lent was originally meant to focus on, and that is repentance. And so, um, as soon as I start talking about sin and repentance, um, immediately people think, oh, well, this isn't going to be very cheery, is it? Well, it depends. You know, firstly, let's say, I'm probably going to... Uh, approach this topically right to so to say some things that the bible says about sin and repentance who's ready (laughs) who's a sinner and if you didn't put up your hand uh it's either because you don't know and that's fine or you need to understand the bible tells us that we have what all sinned and fallen short of god's glory we're so from a biblical perspective Every person is in the same boat. We're all sinners. Now, that thought today is thought of as quite prehistoric. It's like, sin, what are you talking about? And repentance, what do I need to repent from? I'm just trying to to follow my dreams. It's like, who cares if other people get hurt along the way? I'm just trying to realize my full self, live up to my utmost potential, be who I was supposed to be as a human being. And so that's the type of thinking that we have today. Be yourself is the catch cry. And in many instances, society says, no matter what the cost, be yourself. But we need to understand as Christians, we are countercultural. And can I say this? From this day forward, we've got to understand as a church that in the early days of the church, they were persecuted and harassed and viewed as radically different. We have had the privilege and the pleasure as Christian society to be part of Christendom for many hundreds of years, where Christianity has been looked upon favorably in our society. And can I tell you, that is not probably going to be our future going forward. It's going to separate the men from the boys. And already over coronavirus, where things have got hard, right across the church world, people have left and disappeared out of church. And who knows what their walk with Christ is like. It's only going to get harder. That's what the Bible talks about. So we shouldn't be surprised that to be a Christian is to be countercultural. It's the narrow path. It's not the easy path. It's not a broad path. It's the narrow path, the Bible says. So listen, people might not look like it if I talk about sin and repentance. You might not like it. But if we're going to be faithful to the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we must talk about it. So let's talk about some biblical points on sin and repentance. I think the first place to start, everybody, and I put, place myself here, and we must all place ourselves here, is the place of humility. Humility. Because from the world's perspective, and guess what? They're not wrong. It can often seem hypocritical when some of, the, some of our denominations and part of Christendom starts to talk about sin because we have a big log in our own eye. Who knows that to be true? Right throughout history, the Christian church has had some things that we have not done well and we have sinned and we need God's grace. And can I say, it's not just the 
the, the corporate church, it's individually as well. We should always be, can I say this church, we can always be in a place of humility because when we talk about sin, we need to be, as Paul said, I am the chief of sinners. We're all in the same space. Romans 3, all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. That's Paul's assessment of humanity. So we're including ourselves. I'm including myself. And thank God, the difference is, is that if you're in Christ, though you are a sinner, now the New Testament calls you a saint, not because of what you've done, but because of the free gift of grace that God bestows upon you, His mercy in Christ through the cross. Isn't that good news? So we can't earn it. No one can, but He gives it freely. So humility, not judgment. The church is often seen as judgmental, but can I say, let's change the notion of what it means to say, let's start in a place of humility individually and corporately when we talk about sin as the church, because we are no different. Let's cultivate that humility. Let's understand that about ourselves. Now, secondly, the Bible would say this, that sin in its state, its behavior, word or deed or attitude and state is is what is defined by God as wrong. Now, if you look out in the world, most people, unless possibly they're a militant atheist or something like that, because if you're an atheist, you actually got no foundation to call something right or wrong. If there's no God, there's no objective foundation to call something right or wrong doesn't exist all that exists is matter and energy and as Voltaire said we're atoms swimming in a sea of mud right and wrong doesn't exist doesn't matter what you argue and so if God exists then right and wrong does exist but most people in society would say to you yes I believe in right and wrong but it stops at that point because as soon as you start to go down but beyond that surface level and go a little bit deeper what is right and wrong depending on the individual starts to change And in fact, our society these days has some fairly strong ideas that come through in culture about what is right and wrong. And and this is what has happened from the very start. When Adam and Eve were in the garden, this is the principal sin. This is what they did. They said, we have the ability to choose what is right and wrong. God said, don't take the apple. We say, no, taking the apple is okay or taking the fruit is okay. And God said, "I, I have given you many things. I've created you in my image. You have this world to to have stewardship over and have dominion. But one thing I will never share with you as humanity is the right to say, well, that which is right or wrong, only I hold that ability. And so we have to be very careful as the church to understand and have a strong voice in society, a strong voice with humility and the boldness and the wisdom to know when to speak up and when to stay silent. The Bible says a lot about that. But to know and understand that the world does not dictate to us what is right and wrong. As Christian believers, only God has that right. And individually, we don't have that right. Sometimes we are tempted in our own eyes. The Bible says there is a way that seems right to man in his own eyes, but in the end, it leads to death. We don't have that right. And so it's really incumbent upon us as followers of Christ to understand it is all about Jesus, but a lot in the Bible is focused on that which God says, this is right and this is wrong, and this is my standard for you to follow. If sin didn't matter and if morals didn't matter, God would never have talked about it in the Bible. But actually, He talks about it a whole lot. So let's be aware of this as we interact with the world and as we view internally, we are not the author of what is right and wrong. We don't get to decide. God's standards are the right standards. Amen? Thirdly, sin biblically is deadly serious. Deadly serious. The Bible tells us that the end result of sin, the wages of sin are death. Now, if sin wasn't that serious, God could have just said, "Ah, it's okay, I forgive you, I'm merciful, you're all good. But God is not just merciful, He is just. And so He absolutely had to send Jesus to take our place and Jesus volunteered to go. And Jesus said, I will stand in their place. I will be the scapegoat. I will take their sin upon my shoulders. I will bear it so that, and I will die in their place so that justice may be met. God's mercy and his justice come together at the cross. But if God wasn't just, he wouldn't have had to send Jesus. Sin is so serious that God sent his son to die. 
we've got to remember that in the back of our minds when we're walking with Christ and those temptations come up in our mind, we've got to remember when a little voice whispers in the back of our mind, this isn't that bad, God will just forgive me. Grace is not permission to sin. Grace is not permission to do whatever we want. Grace is an empowerment to live for God's standard. And we're not saved by that. We don't earn anything by it. It's a response of love. Fourthly, as we said before, the Bible teaches us that we are all born in sin. Now, once you come to Christ, God pays the price for your sins, but then the New Testament starts to teach us something. It says, don't walk by sin, or don't walk by the flesh, but walk by the Spirit. Walk according to the attitude and the direction and the purpose of the Holy Spirit. Because actually, when we're saved, God does forgive us. His grace covers over a multitude of sins, but He expects us to now start to walk in line with this new kingdom living. Because listen, in our marriage, I can say sorry to Mel for something, and she'll forgive me. She's very forgiving like that. And... I can do something again and she'll forgive me. But listen, if I keep doing the same thing again and again and again and just keep coming back and saying sorry, am I truly repentant? Repentance is not just about a mind change, it's about a behavior change. And that's what God expects of us. So the Bible teaches us that we can actually walk according to the Spirit, not according to the flesh. It doesn't mean that we don't sin anymore. It just means that sin has lost its power over our lives. It doesn't control us. And fifthly, there is a difference for us Christ followers between lifestyle sin and occasional sin. Now you might say to me, no, Tim, the Bible says all sin is sin. Yes, all sin is sin. If you've broken the law, you are a law breaker. That's what the Bible tells us. But Jesus said, those who love me will obey my commands. We all know as Christians who sinned this week. Thought a bad thought, had a prideful attitude, looked too long at that woman walking down the street. We've all done it. Well, not looking at the woman walking down the street. Or maybe, I don't know. But we've all sinned. But there is a difference biblically between lifestyle sin and occasional sin. Though sin has lost the power in our lives, there are times as Christ followers where we wake up in the morning and we didn't think about it, we weren't intentional about it, but we lost our temper or we did something that we we went to God that day and we said, Lord, I messed up. I'm sorry. But there's a difference between that and somebody who says they're following Christ, but is engaged in explicit lifestyle sin that continues without repentance. At that point, I look at that person and my question to them would be, where is the Holy Spirit in your life? What is God speaking to you about? Why are you ignoring the voice of the Spirit? People who are supposedly Christians, but living in adultery, And listen, I'm coming with this point of humility, but I'm simply saying for Christians who say they're following Christ, but find themselves in that position and say, I find nothing wrong with this. I, I would say there'd be a big red light flashing, warning, warning, warning. That's what God is saying right there. And we have a hard heart when we don't listen to that. So we will make mistakes, but there is a difference between making Mistakes and sinning that we all do and living in a lifestyle of sin where there is no repentance, I would have to say, by their fruit, you will know them. So there's many more things we could say on sin. But now I want to talk about repentance and and I want to get into a little bit more of the joyful part. Who knows that Christ's death on the cross covers all our sin? Thank God. His grace is beautiful. The Bible tells us He longs to pour out His mercy upon us. He's so patient. He's so patient with us. He's so good to us. And, And so what is Lent all about? Lent 
is about this time where we intentionally, leading into the remembrance of the death and resurrection of Jesus, where we intend, and we, we want to do this all the time, but it's great to be intentional sometimes, isn't it? We intentionally stand before God as we're coming up to the place where we remember His ultimate sacrifice and His death that paid the price for our sins. As we come into that point, we want to, if you will, get right with God. Just readjust our hearts and our mindsets and just come before God. And maybe it's an opportunity to say, God, I haven't really been walking with you in the way that I know that I should. And I want to repent. I want to change. I want to be intentional. I want to stop that sin. I want to get that sexual sin. I want to get rid of it. These idols that can sometimes be subtle in our life. People want to talk about all the big sins, but, you know, things like greed and unforgiveness, these things which can be subtle and bitterness that grows in our hearts. I want to stop, be intentional and say, God, is there anything within my life that offends you, Holy Spirit? I want to clean that out. So how do we walk in the power of Christ to live that spiritual life, that fruitful life? Well, I, I want to come back to what we started talking about at the start of the year, form and fire, that formation into Christ's likeness and that fire of his presence and it just seems to be that one of the key things for us as Christians is that it's not about willpower sometimes your willpower is involved in staying away from temptations but the foundation for good willpower or self-control is spiritual it's a fruit of the spirit amen and I want to encourage us that one of the best ways that we can fight sin and fight these things in our life is actually diving into the presence of God, reading the Word of God, and getting in His presence. Not just reading the Word, doing what it says. Amen? And getting right to the heart of God's love and God's forgiveness and finding joy in who God is and seeing Him as far greater than any temptation that we might face as human beings. And I say this with all humility because I'm not there yet either. Can I say, we talked about this before, confession is so powerful. And we struggle to confess in the church. Who struggles to confess? I do. I feel so much shame coming to somebody and saying, I've messed up. I've done this. I've messed up. I haven't, haven't got it right. I've looked at this when I shouldn't have looked at it. I've thought this when I shouldn't have thought it. I spoke these words and I shouldn't have said them. James 5.16. I think it's going to be on the screen. It says this. James 5.16. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Can I encourage you, one of the most powerful ways of dealing with sin is confession. Because the enemy's plan is that you would be in shadow and in secret and in shame with the sin in your life. That's where some of the power is. John Mark Combe is a pastor in Portland, um, US. And Portland, if you don't know, it's a super liberal city in the US. They've had riots there pretty much for the whole of coronavirus nobody's really talking about it but John Mark Comer is one of these churches where they can't even meet together he's trying to hold this Christian community together and also be a light of Christ in that community that desperately needs Jesus right now he's an amazing pastor and he said he he wrote this this week and it was so powerful he said stay with your church especially with your closest siblings spiritual family, he's talking about, in the family of God. Live in a thick web of interdependent relationships. Quietly defy the individualism that is wrecking havoc across the West. Surrender your autonomy to love. Isn't this powerful? Place yourself in the constant constraint of community, for it is there we are set free. Give up your preferences for the sake of others. Enroll of the school of agape, which means deep love. When you fail a course, throw yourself upon God's mercy. Come back to the table, eat the bread, drink the wine, ingest the loving, forgi- sorry, the forgiving love of God. Repent, repent again and again. Risk vulnerability, 
We will get hurt and we will hurt in return. That's part of facing grace. Our greatest wounds come from relationships, but so does our deepest healing. The risk is worth it. Powerful words from John Mark Comer there. And he's talking about the fact that we are made to do life as Christian community in deep community. Doesn't mean you have to like walk around town with the scarlet letter on your back. It just means you have some close, safe relationships with brothers and sisters in Christ who love you and understand the gospel really well. That you can stand before them and tell them anything about your life and you will receive authenticity and accountability. The church needs authenticity and accountability. We need an authenticity where we can be honest with one another and say, this is truly what's happening in my life with trusted people. But you also need to expect in that type of authentic, loving relationship, in this interconnectedness of human lives built on Christ, that if we exist in that type of relationship, that you can also expect accountability. Somebody's not going to return to you and say, oh, well, that's okay. You're you're trying your best. They're going to come back to you and say, let's beat this together. That's not okay, but I love you. I'm the same as you. Let's walk forward together. That's what we should expect in Christian community. Proverbs 28, 13. Let's read that. Proverbs 28, 13. People who conceal their sins will not prosper, but if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. This is coming from our Lent plan that we've been reading. Acts 3.19 says this. Now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. I want to encourage you. Let's rely upon the grace of God. Let's learn to accept God's forgiveness and learn to forgive yourself. Some of you need to forgive yourself, and not because you have the power to forgive, but because God's already forgiven you. Let's allow God to intentionally shape our heart. Let's become more like Him, get into His presence, and allow Him to form us into Christ's likeness. It's a journey. We will make mistakes, but let's repent, as John Mark Comer said again, and repent again. Let's have close community. Let's defy the individualism of the West that says you're your own person and you should be who you want to be. But let's say, no, we're called to be countercultural. We're called to support each other and get close in love, this deep spiritual love that the world can't understand because the Bible says, this is how the world will know that you're my disciples. By the way, you what? Love one another. In a community and in a society where cancel culture is happening everywhere and somebody could have said something 20 years ago and now that's who that person is and society wants to cancel them. Let's not be that way. Let's forgive quickly, often and deeply. Let's support one another and show grace to one another and lift each other up and not judge one another. As soon as there is a hint of judgment or legalism, the church is doomed. The Bible says that uh, that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Can I say to you all here today, many of us know the Scriptures well, and we have judgment for other people, but let's be careful how, how fast we are to judge, because it's better to love, even though you know all the Scriptures and you know what they should be doing. Love covers over a multitude of sins. God's desire is that you would draw somebody back in, not repel them out. And there's many... There are many people who stand in legalistic approach to people. It's actually just a form of pride. Because you don't know it all and neither do I. But we want to know God's standard at the same time. And we want to move forward as a community in faith, hope and love. So I want to encourage you today. I want to encourage us all that Christ has paid the price. His blood covers every sin you ever have committed or will commit. And God calls us into a holy living, a beautiful living, a living filled with joy where we understand that His presence sustains us and leads us towards beauty and true humanness is found in the shape of Christ. Sometimes we think freedom means doing whatever we want, but actually doing whatever you want leads to bad consequences. You find true freedom where you find who you were in Christ. When you limit yourself intentionally with the spirit of self-control, that is where you find true limit, uh, unlimitless joy and freedom. That's what the Bible teaches us. It sounds kind of cultural. It sounds like it shouldn't work, but it does. Would we bow our heads and close our eyes together?
Christ Jesus, we all stand here um, with a sense of humility to say that, Father, none of us are better than the other, nor are we, nor are our sins less than somebody else. We have no place to pra- to place pride on ourselves. And so we humble ourselves before you right now. Lord, I confess those times where I have thought, oh, I feel good about myself, but look at that person. They're not doing it right. God, forgive me. Help me to not walk in that attitude. Father, I pray that though as a community, Lord, that we would be so quick to forgive, to be authentic with one another, but to hold each other accountable out of love. That we'd be filled with grace and love. But Lord, we'd encourage each other while today is still today to walk together in the unity of Christ and to be a community that is loving, that we'd love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength and we would love our neighbour as ourselves, because that is the summary of God's standards. Lord, we know it's not loving to lust, to be filled with rage and bitterness, to be prideful to be legalistic, to be unforgiving. We know these things are not loving. But we rely upon the grace of God. I thank you, Father, that your grace sustains us and moves us forward. Lord, we fall, but we rise up. I pray you'd help us be so quick to forgive one another. Help us to love one another. Help us to find that open, joyful life in Christ that is not a set of rules and regulations, but is beautiful and free. Lord, help change our perspectives. May we be filled with the Spirit again this week. Father, I know I will make mistakes this week. We all will. But I pray that we will be quick to repent, quick to forgive. Lord, just We would have this attitude, just as you have forgiven us, we would forgive others. I pray for those here today that are holding on to bitterness in their hearts. And and, and I feel like this prophetically. If that's you, just reach out to the Lord right now. That maybe you're holding on to bitterness about something that someone has said to you or done to you. And God wants to remind us that we have been forgiven by Him, so we should forgive others. Don't hold on to that. It's only hurting you. Lord, I pray right now for all of my brothers and sisters, and I'm there too. Father, the root of bitterness would not grow strong in our hearts. I pray that we would forgive in Jesus' name. We make a decision today, not based upon our feelings, but based upon a decision of our soul. I forgive that person right now in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that you would continue to work that decision of the soul within your people. And right now, I just wanted to ask you, maybe there's some people here, you've never made a decision to accept the forgiveness of Christ. You're not a Christ follower. But what I've been talking about today, that's the message of the gospel. It's good news. The gospel means good news. It sounds bad. Oh, no, I'm a sinner. The good news is, is that Christ paid for it. It's a free gift of grace. And if you want to respond to that, I want to pray with you. But just so we've got our head bowed and eyes closed, this is between you and the Lord. But if you put your hand in the air saying, that's me, Tim, I want to pray. I'd love to pray with you right now. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you up the front. This is between you and God. But that's you. Just put your hand in the air. I'll see it. I'll ask you to put it down. And I want to include you in the prayer I'm about to pray. Is there anyone? Hand right up in the air so I can see it. Yes, I see that hand. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, I see that hand. Thank you. Anybody else? Just linger here a little bit moment. A little bit more. Okay. Father, I pray for these wonderful, beautiful individuals. These sons and daughters of God. You love them, Jesus. You love them. They're the apple of your eye. You so love the world that you sent your only son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. I pray for these ones who have responded. I pray that it would be a heart response, Father. I just thank You that You, right now, as they're responding to You in their hearts and say, "I, I, I want forgiveness, God. Please forgive me. I want to repent. I want to change. And I, I confess You as Lord. I accept that right now. I accept the grace of God. As they're doing that in their hearts right now, 
Your word says, Father, that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead, we will be saved. I thank you, Lord, as they confessed and believed today. Father, I just pray that you, you would do an amazing heart transformation in them, that they would never be the same. Holy Spirit, come and reside within them. Restore them and change them. In Jesus' name. And Lord, I just pray for us as a community that we would get closer, love one another, not be in judgment, but in love, pushing us forward towards the goal, that which is Christ Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thank you, Tim. That was a really great message, a really solid teaching. Thank you so much. Um, you know, just as um, Tim was preaching just now, I just had this sense of, uh, maybe some people sitting here thinking, how am I going to outwork this? How am I going to live this out? And I really felt God wants to remind you that we are not to do um, life alone. He's created us for a relationship. And as we've been making discipleship a real focus in this local church, we've been talking about the concept of uh, rows and circles. And when we come together on a Sunday, um, we worship God and we do life together and we're sitting in rows. Um, but the way we outwork discipleship, the way we do life together, um, the way we sort of get down in the trenches and stand shoulder to shoulder and we know we're not alone is doing life in circles. And um, in our groups, uh, connect groups through Mighty Men, we sit in circles, we look each other in the eye and we actually do life and relationship together. We walk with Jesus daily together. So I just want you to turn your eyes to the screen and have a look at some testimonies of um, people who are doing life in circles. I was never going to go to a, going to go to a men's group because there was people there, they had opinions, they were different to mine, and I didn't want to hear anyone else's opinion. But when I walked in, it was a pretty motley crew. It was, it was a group of real blokes, not trying to pretend they're anything that they're not. They were speaking and talking about things that I'd never heard men talk about before, things that I was facing in life. And they were all just so genuine, you know. I felt like I could trust them straight away. And they're supportive, they listened to you, they didn't judge you. But they were a group of blokes would say it like it was. When we first came to Dream Builders, we struggled a little bit to make friends and to sort of make those really personal connections. Obviously, we loved coming to church on a Sunday, but um, it was only when we started going to connect that we really developed those strong personal relationships with other people in the church. I think we find that being in connect, people share a bit more and you're a bit more open. So you're able to sort of relate to people in different ways. You know, it's not like you can talk on a Sunday about, oh, I'm you know, struggling with this issue or there's this hard thing going on in my life. Whereas when you go to a connect group, um, it's like a family. So you can bring those things up and people can encourage you and minister to you and you can help other people. Everybody can sort of um, give their own insight into what we've just read, um, bring stuff that they've been thinking about over, you know, or praying about or uh, meditating on over the week. As we've gotten more involved with the group and as it's gone on, we've found that going to connect has like been our rock. I have found that um, through the Connect group that I'm a member of, I've really got to know people at a really deep level and they've become, for me, like my special church family. There are people there that I really call a brother in Christ and a sister in Christ. We joined in the spirit. You know, sometimes people can say, oh yes, I'll pray for you, but when members of my connect group were saying I'll be praying for you I'm thinking of you you knew that it was really from the heart and that that was exactly what they were doing for you I think it's really good doing your Christian walk in community there's just so many advantages to help you grow and for you to receive from other people as well as to put in and help them um, on their journey as well. Obviously church on a Sunday is really important, um, but I think that Connect is equally as important. It's that small group where you're getting together, you can do life together and support one another. I don't know what we do without them, to be honest. Like it's, yeah, it's our family, I guess. Yeah. 
So I just encourage anybody who hasn't found a connect group or is maybe thinking about it, weighing it up, just to take the step and join. You've got to challenge yourself. You've got to make yourself available. You've got to seek God. There's so much to learn, and I think it's a really helpful tool to help you learn. Awesome. Can we just thank all of the people who took the time to share um, in that video right now? I just want them to know how grateful we are for their vulnerability. Um, church, if you're not a part of a group, I would love, I'm committed to helping you find a group where you can grow as a disciple of Christ, where you can do life with others, where you can mutually encourage your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's the way we're going to grow in spiritual maturity. Um, so I'll be in the foyer after the service and I would love you just to pop your name down and I will spend the time to help you find a group that would be right for your life stage and your demographic and um, whatever's happening in your world. There are some incredible people in this church and they want to do life with you. Um, also, if you're new here or visiting, um, I'd love to meet you in the foyer as well, um, just after the service. I'd love to introduce myself to you and I'd love to meet you and my husband will be there too. Um, and we would just love to help you in your journey of being a part of this church family. So why don't we stand together, church? We're just going to continue to worship God and then enjoy our time together in the foyer after the service. Stay. 